my name is Jen Palmer. I am with the Creston Valley Farmers Market. We're in the Central Kootenays, and uh, I've just recently been elected onto town council. So I'm right. here to share that this is kind of I'm going to be blocking you guys here. Um, uh, so what I want to chat with you guys about is how to communicate to your local governments why they should care about the work that we do. Uh, some notes about building partnerships and how that helps grow your markets and how that grows your markets in the eyes of local government. And, uh, and then some tips on how do you work with them and what sorts of things can you do to get integrated into their planning. Uh, well, and just a quick show of hands, who has a good, who would say they have a good relationship with their local government? And who is like butting heads? And who doesn't know because we've just had an election? Yeah, okay, so, um, so a bit about me, this is, I've been running the Creston Farmers Market since 2010. I took a couple year hiatus while I had my little girl and now I'm back. And uh, I ran for local government in 2014, and this is a picture, a joint inauguration between our town and uh, the Lower Kootenai Band, which is part of the Tanaha Nation. And apparently we are the first community in all of Canada to have done a joint inauguration with wow. our First Nations community and our local government, which is very exciting, awesome. which is where I was so excited to have participated in that uh, workshop that was given on... Uh, is it only yesterday? The day before? <laughs> yesterday? Yesterday. <laughs> Lost. Uh, so that, that gave me some really practical tips on how, how do I build my relationship. That's an aside. Uh, so, why should they care? Think big. Big picture. We consume, what is that, 100 million meals a day in Canada. How much of that food is being eaten? With local product, there's obviously we know a huge market for growth <laughs> happening here. And I thought this was a really good quote. This is out of a municipal planning magazine, and it says, "Few government officials uh, or municipal councillors consider the totality of the intersection of the food and how communities have been built, how they operate, and how and how their future is going to be shaped by food and food-related issues." And it's so true. And I don't even think even us who are involved at this movement right in the heart really fully understand the scope of what the potential is for what we can create here. So, big picture. The other big piece is that there has been a 50% changeover in local government in the 2014 election. 50% of people elected in 2014 have no local government experience. Uh, but there are people who care. There are people who want to make their communities better places. For the most part, okay? It's not that personal objectives. I may have a bit of a personal agenda. I think it's for the good of the community. And it, so when we talk about opportunities, what I'm trying to do here is frame them in ways that local governments will listen. Use the words that matter to them. We foster local economic development. That BC economic impact study spoke volumes to our local government. I went and I gave a presentation on it. We contribute $1.72 million annually to the local economy. For a town of 5,000 people, that got people listening to what we do. So for BC AFM board members and people, I made this plug yesterday as well, I would like to see regular impact studies done every five years or whatever it takes. I think that those are huge and it is beyond the scope of what I can really do in my market on my own. I don't need a big full picture of it all. Farmers markets are obviously incubators for local businesses, for small scale businesses. We've seen a lot of businesses outgrow our farmers market as a stepping point, which means that then maybe they're going to open up a storefront downtown. Maybe they're gonna open up some sort of a distribution center. All of those pieces. Farmers markets address food security issues. This is starting to come on the radar for local governments, and we'll start seeing some more examples of that later on in the presentation. This is also where the nutrition coupon program comes in, addressing uh, 
folks who, who are having those challenges getting nutritious food into their diets, I would like to see that program expanded because Preston is not one of those people, one of those markets who, uh, who are part of that, so I'd like to see that expanded and myself over there. Uh, for those who live in urban areas, farmers markets can be a bit of a food oasis where there's no other grocery stores around and that you get high quality, affordable, seasonal products. We build community. It's good, happy places to be. It is a free and regular gathering place in the community, low barrier, anybody can go there. It's the fluffy stuff. We obviously support environmental sustainability, less, uh, more local food, less food travel, less food miles. Uh, and at our market, we're seeing how much we are supporting the local organic movement, reducing the amount of pesticides and herbicides sprayed in our valley. That said, I live in a fruit growing region, and those fruit trees take a lot. But, but because of that, we're seeing more customers asking for more organic produce. We have seen some of our farms who have transitioned out of the regular pesticides and herbicides uh, and gone more, done it more organic agriculture, even if they don't get certified organic, but they're still using better practices. This is one that's been hitting uh, really strongly with our local government, is that we are revitalizing downtown. Uh, we are turning our sleepy little town into a vibrant shopping hub on a Saturday morning. It's really fun. Creston, our downtown, it's about three blocks, uh, and there's half of the storefronts are empty. We have big challenges in our community, and our local government sees the value that we provide in creating that hub of activity. The economic impact study demonstrated how much money people spend at surrounding local businesses. We were able to get the businesses on board and support us, where before they, they saw us as competition. And then healthy communities really thrive. We want our communities to be healthy. Health issues are obviously overwhelming. Provincial budgets, federal budgets, and this is getting to more. Let's start investing in people and doing prevention instead of mitigation afterwards. Municipalities have been a leader in so many great movements that have changed our entire country. Smoking. Municipalities were a leader in banning where smoking can be done, where it's acceptable, where it's not acceptable. Uh, with recycling, it starts with local governments and now you're seeing it, be, that's the norm. And so, I think that we are in a position that we will end up becoming, this will be the norm, right? We're gonna, for anybody who's in the shell workshop, there, we're getting onto that bell curve, and we're gonna see a tipping point. Then, and poor nutrition affects a person's well-being, their socioeconomic status. There's lots of studies out there showing that if you're not eating properly, you're not going to be as healthy and thriving as a person, contributing to your society as much. So that's just summed up as less nutritious food, more at-risk people, future social problems that are ultimately going to cost our communities more. Invest in the farmer's market, and you'll save money down the road. However, there's so many challenges with working with local governments. Really being able to figure out how to convey what you need as a market to your local government. Uh, what are your needs? What are the benefits that you provide? Uh, you need to speak in their language. There's inconsistencies between markets uh, for local government regulations, for health authority regulations. I get, we get vendors who come around to different markets. Well, so-and-so at this market says I can do this. So-and-so at this market says I can't do that. Uh, we're finding that to be a very big challenge. Uh, so that, I think, needs to be up to the farmers markets surrounding each other need to come together and make sure that what they're doing works for the vendors and works for their communities. Lack of permanent space, risk of relocation year to year. This was a big, big one for us. At first, we were signing one year lease agreements for a site. Sorry, you can't be there. Oh, you have to move. And the, 
the stress and money of changing locations is <laughs> causing great hairs. <laughs> and then just the challenges that we had when we were starting up is just navigating all of the permits, the requirements, the regulations for getting in. And so we have worked really hard with our local government over the last five years to streamline those permits, to streamline those regulations. Um, they can take down the red tape. You just have to let them know what it is. So, how to work with local government. Number one, go to them every year as a delegation. Who gives an annual report to their local government once a year? Okay. Do it. Do it, do it, do it. Ten minutes. Do not take any more than ten minutes. Council meetings can often end up going into the five-hour range. We are all very passionate about what we do, but don't spend half an hour talking to them. Up Make it short and sweet. Hit those key points of things that you need. So, any specific requests that you have, if you want them to reduce the red tape and the permits and the regulations that you're going through, get it into writing. Uh, and because that needs to go to council as a recommendation, the council needs to pass it, so it makes it easier instead of just saying, "Oh well, it's kind of difficult." No. Uh, say all of our vendors, the town was there, the municipality was requiring all of our vendors to buy individual business licenses. We would like to buy one business license for our community. That makes it a lot easier for them to understand what you are asking for. And then this is and talk to staff before you go to a council presentation. Staff in a municipality are there to implement the wishes of the council. Council doesn't actually do any of the hands on on the ground work. They're the policy makers. So talk to staff. They're going to guide you through how to work with council, what needs to be done. <laughs> can, I just, can I just add to that? Absolutely. Um, to make sure that you're doing the same with your provincial um, connections as well. Right. Making sure that at least once a year you go and meet with your health authority, uh, perhaps in your region, just being proactive. Absolutely. It's so much easier than being reactive. That's it, such a good point, absolutely. We're really lucky our health authority, our, our EHO is a regular shopper at our farmer's market. And so it makes it really easy for me. I had somebody, you know, I can, <coughs> if a vendor presents me with a new product, I can just grab them. Hey David, what do you think about this? What are we gonna need to do through this? It makes it really easy when you build, and it's relationships. It's about building those relationships so you can give them a call and that they're not having to chase after you and work in a reactionary way. Uh, and also with your MLA as well. Our MLA is incredibly supportive of our farmers market. Sorry, you're not. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, it, it's it's really really wonderful. Yeah. When you say go once a year and give a report, a report on, or are you meaning just go and ask for stuff? Right, so when I go and I give my annual report, uh, so I'm going to be doing it uh, in three weeks, I think is our, our next council meeting that I'll be presenting at. I'm going to go to them with information that I've learned from this conference, specific things that I can say, hey, this is what we can do as we work towards making things better. I also give them a lot of statistics on, um, I give them statistics on this is how many vendors we've had at our market. This is uh, the gross annual sales that data that we have been collecting from our market. This is how many customers we have. Local government also really wants to have really impactful things to put into their annual report. And if they can say they're a supporter of your farmer's market, they can say, oh, and the farmer's market generated X amount of dollars at in this past year, it's a pat on the back for them. So you want to help them feel good about helping you. So how do you handle when staff, like, you want to go to the council, but the staff is putting up every roadblock? <laughs> I'm a counselor. I don't know. <laughs> Call yeah, over there. Staff. Yeah, so yeah, I would start, no, um, yeah, no, no, it's just a, yeah, when staff is putting up those roadblocks for you. Because so, we, like, the incident, uh, incident is that, Mayor and all councillors shop at the farmer's market. Yeah. 
we have one staff member who is just like grinding us. And when we told the mayor and the counselors how much we're paying for Ramsey Point, like, well, we'll try, we'll deal with that. Yeah. And when they take it back to staff, then they're told, we, you, you can have reduce their rent. We need it to cover operating costs. So, so it, it, I mean, I don't want to get into the discussion here, but, but that's the roadblock we get. But that's where you come to. So, staff, staff has no choice but to go with what council and mayor has to say. That is what they have to do. They, but staff, council and mayor don't talk directly to staff. Council and mayor, talk to the CAO, your, your city manager, uh, your chief administrative officer. So that needs to make sure, if you can get a meeting with a council person and your mayor and your CAO, that CAO is the boss of all of those staff people. So it's building building that higher up relationship and yeah, hammering on them. And complain about it year after year. Show them how it's hurting your market which is hurting your community. So what can local government do? This is a wide variety of things that our local government has done over the past five years to help us. Uh, we've got permanent signage that's up, they take care of our waste management, they close streets for us, uh, we have a storage shed, this shed is on municipal property, they let us leave it and place it there. They provide us with electricity, they rent us toilets when the visitor center is closed during part of the year. Uh, they have put in water hookups for us. They help us facilitate partnerships and uh, we've had to have zoning changes and local regulations changed. And I do remember seeing this one come up, the zoning regulations come up in a BCAFM market manager loop about a market saying that uh, they weren't zoned properly to be able to allow liquor sales. So if you're not, that's it's okay that but you start from there and you go to council to request for that zoning to be changed. You may take months. But you have to get that process started. Uh, and don't disobey them. Bad things don't make your town angry. <laughs> so there's our, our nice little shed, which was really great, but uh, and the more municipalities really can do, the better. And it, and explain to your municipality that crippling the market with extensive fees makes it very difficult for you. Show them your budget, show them your numbers, show them the percentage that you have to pay in rent for whatever it is. Don't forget to calculate that there's a lot of data you can tap into on this. Calculate what the expenditures are um, in two cases. One is when the consumer comes to the farmer's market, what else do they spend in town? Typically, it's another $30 that so they spend in the business. In many cases, they wouldn't come to town unless it's market day. Absolutely. And the second thing is for every dollar that a marketer takes in, they spend a dollar fifty in the community for. So that's the packaging, the labeling, the lawyer, the accountant. Those are figures you want to quote the sales of the market, but you want to quote those secondary economic impacts that's there. That's where you get your business association on board. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So really, just so sorry if you yeah. want to, if you want to access those stats on the BC Farmers Market website <laughs> under resources. There's the updated social and economic impact of farmers markets for 2012. So the data is there at a provincial and a Canadian level. The data is a little bit old on what folks spend at markets, but at least it's something to quote. At least it's there, yeah, and the last economic impact study was done in 2012 for BC, for those markets that participated, so that's still fairly recent as well. So they can also provide space, obviously. Uh, we rent our space for a dollar a year outside. Uh, just, I don't even, they just do it. I think it's really funny being able to come in and bring a balloon. Uh, and then the other piece is this long-term leases. You get three, five-year guarantees that you are going to be on that land. Or if you don't like where you are, start getting working to the spot that you want to be. Know that that process can take a long time. Government is very slow. So slow. Painfully slow. Uh, promotional support. Obviously, this is, uh, you know, we're up on our 
municipality's website, it gets blasted out on their Facebook page. However, my Facebook page has way more followers than theirs. <laughs> it's up there. Uh, and uh, the promotional support also comes in the signage. Uh, they, when the municipality went through and redid their signage bylaw, it, which hadn't been updated since I think 1995, and it got redone this last year, they specifically talked to the farmers market, say, what kind of signage do you need? How do we need to let you do it? What do you need? Uh, because we keep, we've been coming to them time and time again, saying this is what we need. So when those things come up onto a council's priorities, then they already know that you're an interested stakeholder. They're not going to know unless you go to them. They can't read your mind. Uh, our local government has also provided us with uh, financial support. Lots of communities have local grants available. If you're lucky enough to live in the Columbia Basin Trust region, it's a really great place to be. I'm sure that there's lots of other granting sources around that are local grants. Maybe, maybe not. I really love CBT. Uh, they also provide, you know, the in-kind support in the, the form of land, like we had talked about. We've also had our local government write letters of support for work that we are doing. So that speaks volumes to funders as well. And it really doesn't take a lot of effort for them. And so those really help leverage other community resources. And then this is the single business license for a market was something that I had to get on right away in 2010. They were going to request an $80 business license from every single vendor who came to the market. Ridiculous. So I negotiated with them that we would just buy one single business license for the farmer's market. All of our vendors would be covered under. How much? $80. $180? $180 license. For our entire market. Oh, actually, so it was $80 the first year because they didn't have a nonprofit category. The next year they implemented a nonprofit category, so now it's $25. <laughs> yeah. So that saved our vendors so much money. It made a really big impact. Building partnerships, obviously, partnerships help our communities thrive. Local governments like to see you play nice with other groups. They are constantly getting bombarded for requests and asks from so many different agencies and groups. So if you can go to them and say, hey, here we are, we're all playing nice, we're all working together, your chances for success greatly increase. So this is a mural project that we did uh, with, uh, so this is a, a Crest Ceramics group, that's what the group is called. They work with people with, uh, with physical challenges and impairments and this was a teen summer teen program. So these two young girls here participated in the summer program. We get painted murals once a week. So now these murals are going to be put up onto this ugly concrete wall that we have at our farmer's market that just makes it look terrible. And now it's going to brighten up the space. It's used as a walkthrough for the folks who uh, come from Crest Ceramics. It's a little pathway up into the town. And uh, so we were able to express ceramics, put some money in, we put some money in, the town put some money in, and it worked out great. And then we did an opening day. This is our MLA here who came and we did uh, the unveiling of this on World Food Day. Everybody's happy, they got the pictures everywhere, it's going to make everything look prettier. Who, who funded the murals? Uh, it was a combination. TELUS provided some funding, Columbia Basin Trust provided some funding. Uh, the farmer's market put in some of our own funding in terms of my staff time being there, and, and then the town gave us some funding. So, and two murals. Oh, and we have got a lot of, some of the supplies donated from the local home builders and Pyramid Building Supply Center. So all in all, I was like, oh, two murals, that can't be too big of a project budget. Cost too much. <laughs> By the time you add it all up, it was like a $6,000 project, which seemed astronomical when we first started budgeting it out, but they're going to look great. And we got a local artist to design them for us using imagery. Uh, Jesse, this guy here, and I sat down with a local artist in town, and we said, what are all the things that we have at the market? And then she put it all together, designed it in a way that the students that we were working with, they could participate in it, be able to paint it. It was all a paint-by-numbers kind of thing. 
And it was my favorite Wednesday morning to go in and go paint these girls for six weeks. It's really fun. So, there you go. Local governments really want to see you build these kinds of partnerships. And promote them. Like, promote the heck out of these things when you do it. Pat yourself on the back and make it very visible. And then, so beyond the partnerships, it's about supporting the local food movement on a bigger scale within our communities. Farmers markets are really just one piece of the local food movement in our towns. So this is where you can encourage, if you're, I assume you're all interested in the broader local food movement besides just farmers markets. So encourage your municipality to introduce new zoning policies. Encourage market gardens on vacant land. This is something, or community gardens on vacant land. Uh, this is something that we are in the process of working with our town about. Allow the sale of food from doorsteps. So municipalities don't let you do that unless you have a business license or a certified at home business. So if you live in town, let them be. Make sure your local government allows you to sell the extra kale that you have in your backyard or the eggs from the chickens that you are allowed to have in your backyard. So allowing backyard bees and chickens. I campaigned. The, the one and only specific initiative I campaigned on was backyard chickens and bees. That was it. <laughs> and, uh, and generally supporting all the good things in our community. So I am determined that in the next four years we are going to have bees and chickens in Creston. Check that out. <coughs> Although, that said, but as a side note, we were on discussion a panel during election time. There was 15 of us running for six spots. And the question was asked from the audience, do you support backyard bees and chickens? And in my like young, enthusiastic, naive kind of way, I was so happy and excited. It was like, oh, that's our first. Yes! Every other single counselor, oh, yeah. candidate there, no, no, no. No longer the head of me. So I'm going to be coming to all the, looking at all the municipality bylaws that allow backyard chickens and bees, presenting it to our council, and saying, this is what other communities have done, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So Ours look, just passed it. What's the name? 100 Mile House. 100 Mile House? Yes, yeah, and I almost got a good one. <laughs> yeah, there's so many things. And a lot of counselors and folks live in their little bubbles. They don't always know what's going on. You have to show them. You have to tell them. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting them a big stack of these or other communities that do it, and this is how we can. Encouraging food infrastructure facilities in your community, um, food processing places, storage, transportation, distribution. These, for me, those are big wish list items right now. We are nowhere near getting to that in Preston right now, but I'm getting it onto their radar, and we're starting. And then this is, by doing that, you cluster businesses, you get a synergy going, the ball is just going to keep rolling faster and faster, theoretically. That's what I'm hoping for. And uh, we have really worked with our local chamber of commerce on this one, driving consumer demand through local food, through promoting it. Promoting it more than just the farmer's market. We're about to embark on a campaign in connecting restaurants to farmers to consumers. And we're participating in it as the farmer's market and uh, and connecting, building, building that community priorities and, and and preference. So more beyond the market, make sure that your local government knows that the local food movement isn't just about farmers markets. If you're interested in the broader, bigger picture, let them know and work with them on that. And we are missing out on big opportunities if we just focus on farmers markets. There's, if we're really going to create the, the local food movement in the way that I truly believe that people will eat local the vast, vast majority of the time, if we will become what Cuba has had to do, it's going to require a lot more work than just farmers markets. And that this was uh, a quote that I found in uh, another planning magazine. 
that it's going to become a cycle of job creation, entrepreneurship, community spirit, and local pride. Great. Yes. You keep walking in front of them, so that's where this projector is not such a sway. So this is working with local businesses. This is part of the, the campaign that we are working with our Chamber of Commerce. It's all branded beautifully. I love it. The, there's a lot of people in our community that don't really like it. And <laughs> work with the surrounding local businesses. Talk about the positive and negative impacts on the surrounding businesses. One of the best things that we have been able to do with some of our surrounding businesses when they say, oh, we don't like the farmer's market. It hurts our business. Does it? Can you show me? How? And then they're at a loss for words. And then they start to rethink what they're saying. And what they and those local businesses can often get for us it was like a coffee shop. Coffee shop, coffee shop talk, where you've got the order of the coffee shop saying that the farmers market hurts their business, that's gonna spread. But as soon as you have that discussion with that person and they change what they are saying, change their perception, that was strong. On that one of the issues that we had come up was exactly that coffee shop is still a totally a game because we have two coffee shops, one at either end of the market. Yeah. One coffee shop every morning when we got there would come out and bring a sample of coffee to all of our vendors. <laughs> We've had a coffee vendor okay. and um, the other coffee shop is going like, go away, go away. And we decided as a market to go to our five-year coffee vendor in the our location and said, you know, in respect for the coffee shops that either end of the road, we, are, we have to ask you not to come anymore, which was, you know, hard. hard. Yeah. However, that was a, a business decision we made. Um, one of the coffee shops, the one who was giving us samples was, oh, thank you very much. The other one is still saying, go away. And um, when, I, when one of our members went and talked to it, so I have to hire two extra staff in my extra business, and I don't really want. Uh, uh, yeah. What the sign saying? Don't come to this yeah. Yeah. Show. Yeah. 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 Don't come here. That's like crazy story. Yeah. 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 That's so crazy. <laughs> yeah, I just wonder how you would deal with sort of an opposite scenario where we have um, a little flower shop in town. And on our Friday markets, we have this wonderful man that comes up um, from a little south of our town. And he has amazing, amazing flowers. Yeah. Uh, giant lilies and just, and everyone in town shows up every Friday and buys giant bouquets of flowers from this man. So naturally, she has complained that she sells like nothing on Friday. Like she might as well just keep her store closed. So how do we build a better relationship with her but because everyone, that flower guy just draws people to the market. They just, anyway. we can't grow flowers like that. He's, <laughs> he's a little south of us, but he's been warmer. supporting our market, like coming to our market for, yeah. We, we also have a cut flower vendor and I provide, they're my, one of my anchor vendors at the end because they provide such an incredibly impactful booth. Anybody have some yeah. suggestions on how yeah, to Yeah, because we don't want to lose him, but we don't like making her upset either. So what do you do about that? I recommend what, what, what we've done with a clothing vendor, not vendor, a clothing store in our area, is we actually, we, we don't give them a market space per se, but we invite them to be a part of our market in that, like, you, are, is your flower store on this, like, the market walk? Yes. Then I would, and I would make sure that your driving customers and ask that you be a sponsor of the market and you'll have a big sign there saying, you know, John's Flower Store is a sponsor of our market. He doesn't have to sponsor it with money, he just has to sponsor it in saying, shop at the local market. We, that's what we do. We allow the, 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 the businesses that are along the street to be closed to put sign their sandwich boards out in the also give the flower shop lady a sandwich board at the market or sign or some kind of advertising. Yeah, because it sounds like you're flat, cut flower 
guy who comes to Target already has an incredibly loyal following. Oh, yeah. Like, like I said, everyone you just see, everybody walking around the market with these huge bouquets that is very reasonably priced, and, and they're amazing. And uh, so, like, everybody in the town seems to have come flying down to the market right away on Friday morning to get their flowers, yeah. right? Yeah. She's stores yeah. hire him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was one of my suggestions. Like I said, maybe she should buy flowers from yeah. him. Yeah. Because <laughs> but I, I, I was just going to say, from a, a manager's perspective, you can do a lot to increase your connection with the local business community just by how you lay your market out. So, for instance, uh, if you have a street that's closed down and the business is on either side, instead of putting the vendors on the edges of the street with their backs to the shops, because then the vendors, customers tend to stream down the middle of the road and they, they have to pass through the booths to get to the local business. So simply rearrange your stalls so that the stalls are in the middle of the row, they're back to back with each other, and then the consumers are then placed between the market stall and the existing businesses. Yeah. You can also do it just in squares, setting up four stalls in a block and four stalls in a block. So just so you have a fire lane. thinking about how yeah, you're thinking of your fire lane. Yeah. Yeah. Just thinking about how you actually arrange your market can really make a difference in the perception that the businesses have about how inclusive you are of those existing businesses. So think That's about your really layout. Point. The same, that exact same situation happened in Nelson as well when they started doing their Wednesday downtown market that takes over a couple of blocks. The downtown merchants caught me in arms because they had all the vendors <coughs> facing in, and then they made all the vendors face onto the sidewalk. Boom, everybody's happy, not a big deal. There's another comment. I just I think you should really try to connect the two. Um, not only could he be selling her flowers, he could also be promoting her for the rest of the week. So if he had some kind of signs or something like that, um, then that way people when they want flowers for the rest of the time, so it might increase the number of business that day, but on the rest of the days. And so if people see partnerships with people working together in the community, it might yeah, they might strengthen their business that way. Or at least make her feel better to have that connection with him. Yeah. yeah, and it ultimately comes down to those relationships again, really having those frank discussions. What's bothering you? What's, what is hard? How can I help? How can I change this for you? Which leads into our next point here about talking to those businesses about those positive and negative impacts. So when we, we were going, we were changing a market location, trying something new, we went around and surveyed the surrounding local businesses, wrote down all their comments came back to council with that presentation and said, this is the proposed market spot that we would like. We have talked to all of the surrounding businesses. Here's what they have to say. It goes a long way if you do your like, work and your homework like that. And, and then when you're talking to those businesses, tell them about the local, the economic impact studies and say, well, we found in this study that people on average are gonna spend another $30 Town. They're going to go out for lunch afterwards. They're going to go pick up whatever it is that they need. And for us, because we live in a rural community, we've got a large surrounding population. So folks who live up the lake, who are half an hour away, they don't come into town every single day. When they're going to come into town, it's going to be on a Saturday, and they're going to get everything done in one full swoop. So this one, become a member of your Chamber of Commerce. This comes with a caveat. That's what your chamber of commerce is like. Depends <laughs> what it's like in your community. If you have a downtown business association or whatever that group is in your community that are the business movers and shakers, figure out if you can become a member of it. This has gone a long ways for us in Preston. Uh, so like I said, we're doing this campaign, marketing campaign with them. So that is generating extra money for our farmers market is helping promote our farmers market vendors and other people, other farmers who aren't members of our farmers market vendor, but it's helping the local food, food movement as a whole. And uh, my office is located in the Chamber of Commerce. I have regular discussions with our chamber manager that's there. It's also, I think, in most communities, the Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Info Centers are now one for a lot of places. So we get all the tourists that come through there. So we get people constantly coming to the oh, what about the food? I get this, and they're like, well, the market manager is just sitting in her office there, you can have a chat with her, and uh, I also got another good idea from being here at this conference to start handing out little $2 coupons to those tourists who are coming through, 
say, oh, hi, thanks for having a nice chat with me, or give it to the girl who runs the info center, and get close to those tourists to encourage them to come to your market. So, got uh, lots of great little ideas here. Um, it's a little blow my own horn thing. Um, we've been, we belong to the Chamber of Commerce for a long time in Vernon, and we just got nominated for this excellent award by the Chamber of Commerce. And you found that last night. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, another thing just came up in the last session, I don't know if Rick's here, but he mentioned that, uh, or somebody mentioned that if you're a member of the Chamber of Commerce, it drops your credit card fees. Yes, from 3.5. Oh, you mentioned that. So can you just share yeah, that again? Well, if, if you have a retail business and you have uh, a lot of Visa and MasterCard starts three point five percent more. Uh, if you're a member of the chamber or a member of retail DC or a member of the restaurant association, you get about one point six, one point six five. Oh, that's a that's a great one. <laughs> um, we belong to the Board of Trade in um, Burnaby and the Chamber in North West Vancouver. And whenever we attend those meetings, we usually bring um, a door prize. From the park to park. So that it just gives that like, extra, um, it, that everybody always says, it goes about it. And it's way better than bringing two cornstones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that. And you should have lots of business networking events. <sighs> our, our chamber is just spearheaded on this initiative. So this Roger Brooks, write this name down, Roger Brooks, he is an international tourism guru who puts on these huge webinar series and comes around and does the consulting. Our chamber has bought a license for these tourism videos and is hosting weekly video sessions where everybody, where businesses are coming together. Uh, nope, Roger Brooks. Uh, and so we so we we're participating in these. One of them is how to. One of his videos is how to build a successful public market. So we are having these discussions with our downtown merchants, with this internationally recognized tourism guru, saying this helps helps add an air of legitimacy, and uh, we're getting a lot more buy-in. Have to sign up for the videos. Roger, or through your... Uh, so if you Google Roger Brooks, it will take you to his tourism website, where there's a lot of free information, and then there's some paid information on there. Uh, I have learned so much from, from him. Would have never found it without our chamber of commerce. And obviously, be a, be a champion for local business. Speak positively. Do good things. Okay, so that's kind of the bigger picture thing. This is some really specific things on working with local governments, how they do their planning, and how you can get involved. And so I have gone through and found tons of really great information. There are some amazing farmers, farmers markets out there who have done amazing work with their local governments. So kudos to those. So understand the policy documents when you're working with a local government, they are concerned about CPs, official community plans, ICS fees, integrated sustainability community plans, regional growth strategies, zoning, neighborhood plans, regional plans, it's all about plans. Find a champion on council. If there is somebody that you see on your council that you're like, be there a bit of a kindred spirit. Go for coffee with them. Talk to them. Get them to buy into your idea. Uh, the same also goes um, for a staff person. Work with a designated staff person. Ask your council if there is one person that you can go to time and time again that will understand the whole picture of this. Totally different person depending on your municipality. I had uh, always been working with our town manager. CAO. I just worked with the person at the top because we live in a town of 5,000 people and there's not that many staff. It's probably a very different thing if you live in Vancouver. <laughs> but 
but find out who that person is. Get that direction. Know what the local granting process is when they offer local grants, how to participate in them. One of the things when I first started in 2010, so we have these grants that come out, they're always due at the beginning of March. We realized that I supposed to go to all of these meetings while they're deciding these grants and like help promote my idea. And so I kept not getting as much money as I was asking for. And then went and talked to our local representatives and said, what happened here? They're like, well, you never showed up. I know what the process is. So land use policies, zoning, all parcels in a community are divided into are, are zoned for what is the, what can happen there, what is allowed to be done. And so zoning changes, they can take months and months they don't happen overnight. They go to council. They go through the assembly, they go through a first reading, they go through a second reading, they have to go through a process, they have to be adopted, they have to be implemented. So, you know, if you need something rezoned, you work in like three, six months in advance, be patient, and then don't go bad mouthing your local politicians if things aren't happening fast enough, because that is a sure way to burn your bridges. And allow farmers markets. Uh, I was looking at some some places in communities saying that farmers markets are only allowed on public lands. What happens if there's private property that you'd like to use for Make sure that you're allowed to do that. So that's we're talking with the staff person. So zoning. Your council people and your mayor probably don't know all the ins and outs of what parcels are zoned what. That's going to be your local town planner, your local city planner. They're going to be able to let you know. And that's their job. So, official community plans, the OCP process. No. So, my background, I did a geography degree at UVic, and so I learned a lot about this stuff. I have no idea if this is normal in people's worlds if they know what OCPs are. So, <laughs> it's a public planning process. It involves the community, it's got a big vision and a big scope. Generally, 10 to 15 years. Right now, my town is sitting on OCP that is 18 years old. It's bad. They've been talking about updating it for a long time, but it's like a $200,000 project. Oh, it's kind of the real tax base. It takes a while to get through that. So, and it focuses on everything. It's the big picture of the community. It's transportation, it's land use, it's the parks, it's recreation, it's business development. So farmers markets fit into this on multiple different levels. Everything that your community does after an OCP has been adopted, all their bylaws need to align with it. So when you get yourself pieced into that OCP, we have to support you. There are more and more official community plans that are including food security components. And I'm gonna show you guys some examples from this. And then uh, in 2008, the provincial government passed Bill 27, the Green Communities Act, which mandates that local governments have to figure out ways to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, they have to report on targets, and they have to develop action plans to help mitigate this. And official community plans require a public process. You can show up and uh, Anybody, anybody can be there. So at best, what you want to do, if you can, get on that steering committee. It's going to be made up of a group, 10, 15 people or something like that. Keep yourself as a member on there. And if not, go to all the public meetings. So, this is one, okay. Uh, so I, this is a whole bunch of examples and this PowerPoint will be provided afterwards so if you want if you're going through an official community planning process in your community i pulled out some clips of things that give you some idea and direction for what kinds of pieces you can get included in it so most of you probably won't be able to read this but this is one campbell river talked about it in there saying food and agriculture planning is a largely new and unfamiliar territory for most communities it is we're embarking into unknown territory here we, we are the leaders in this. 
So specifically, under their objectives and policies in Campbell River, they said they want an abattoir. They want a permanent farmer's market. They want food processing and storage and packaging. So when that gets written into the OCP, it doesn't mean that a magic wand is going to be waved and poof, those things are going to exist. But it gives you the direction for what you're working towards. Nelson also pops a little bit into there about that food security is important to their community. They want to support food security initiatives and support their farmers market. Here is where was this one from? Okay. Vancouver, I think. Anyway, so this is this one tackles the, the health end of things. It says that people who live close to farmers markets or pocket markets or food outlets are eleven percent less likely to be obese or overweight because they exercise and eat healthier food, drawing those health community community population health indicators along the long This one, Pemberton. Anybody here from Pemberton? By chance? I've heard that they have just built an outdoor farmer's market cover of space. Amazing. This this was put into their OCP a few years ago and there you go, they have it. I had uh, one of the previous counselors who didn't free run came up to me after taking a tour at Pemberton after, um, I think it was the Union of UBCM conference, and came up to me and was like, you should see what Pemberton did, this is what we need. We need that kind of champion on your side. And I just mentioned that the mayor of Pemberton was, it was Jordan Sturdy, who was now there at ML, MLA for a wow. So, and so he was then behind that. Oh, I was so impressed, and I was looking at pictures of it, and so happy. Uh, and so this is where this one's talking about the zoning. Look at the zoning bylaws. So this gets written in as a policy with no official community plan. Make sure that farmers' markets are allowed on public and private grounds. And then this next one, the city should include a comprehensive definition of farmers' markets in the zoning bylaws. So you'll see some other examples coming up where communities are putting in the BC AFM's definition of the farmer's market saying, this is what we allow. So that when you get that road market that comes up selling the stuff that we don't want, they say, no, I'm sorry, you're not permitted. And now that we have a new definition, there you go. <laughs> it's even clearer. Uh, this one here is saying, continue to accommodate a downtown farmer's market if recognizing it provides economic opportunities, it's a source of local food. Where is this one from? Summerland. There. And, it, and it's taking the bigger picture of things. OCPs are big pictures. Another one, where are we at? This one, Surrey. Yeah, talking about farmers markets in here, improve the access to them, support the development of farmers markets. So go back to your community, see if farmers markets or food security is mentioned at all in your OCP. And if it's not, that's a good spot for you to start when that process comes up. Um, I believe this one was from Victoria. Uh, encourage the development of farmers markets in town centers and urban villages and a viable year-round farmers market in the downtown port area. So when they are rezoning places, when they are looking at development, that's on council's agenda saying, this is something that we have issued as a priority. How are we going to make it happen? Then, beyond the OCP, so that's just one of the many plans, uh, <laughs> integrated community sustainability plans. All communities had to create these to be able to get the gas tax. All communities are getting a gas tax that's based on population. Gas tax can be spent on farmers' markets. By the way, so find out if they have a plan for how they're spending their gas tax. Get onto their radar. Our town of five thousand people gets uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in gas tax. It's big money. It can go a long way. So I have it earmarked. Going, how is this going to help our farmers market one day? That just build us a nice permanent space. So OC or. ICSPs, big picture thinking, 30 to 50 years in scope. They're very long term, they're very broad. Question. 
Uh, and so they help the community reach sustainability objectives. They address climate change. They build healthier communities with the, the theory that it's less costly to operate a sustainable community in the long run. So this is just some clips of, this is the one from Preston's ICSP. So it's really high level in talking about we're supporting the local food movement, the agriculture sector is diversified, value-added products, boom, action item, permanent space for the farmer's market. I know I'm going to be working on with my community on permanent farmer's market space for a while, but it takes time for it to happen. And then this highlights how important these partnerships are. We're working with the Chamber of Commerce, we're working with our local college, we're working with lower QB band, we're working with the town, we're working with the economic you don't need to do this by yourself. Here's Duncan's. So they, and they highlight that uh, one of the thriving things in Duncan is their farmer's market. And that that is a success story that's recognized in there. And by the way, Duncan, I absolutely love their logo so much. One of my favorites. Uh, and then again, an action item. Find a secure local year round indoor and outdoor space for farmers markets for Dublin and the Valley. Getting these things into writing helps work on it becoming a reality. Invermere did their ICSP. Nothing specifically about farmers markets as an action item, but what they do recognize is that farmers markets are an indicator. So they measure the number of farmers market days. So this is where reporting back to your municipality on Visitors you have had important information. People like numbers. People like reporting on numbers. Uh, Rebel Stoke highlighted that they have a farmer's market that occurs weekly, twice a month in the winter. And then one from Kimberly. So, and it was interesting going through the ICSPs. Farmer's markets and food somehow weren't mentioned in most of them, which I thought was kind of bizarre. Uh, and then Somebody told me that a lot of communities just kind of threw their ICSPs together just so they could get the gas tax, so it wasn't something that was very taken very seriously. But again, uh, Kimberly recognized that food was a really important description of success for their community yeah. down the road. Regional growth strategies. Are we doing on time? Just a couple minutes. Hey, they're led by regional districts. There's not lots of them through the community. We have none in the Kuvis. They're more concentrated in the more densely populated urban areas. They involve municipalities, provincial agencies, rural area. And they're going to focus on a lot of the same things that an OCP does, but bigger than just the one municipality. And everything, this is the same. All of the bylaws that are then created afterwards need to be in line with that regional growth strategy the same as no CP. Comox Valley, obviously highlighting the importance of farming in, in the Comox Valley. And then they've got on here, so supporting the Farmers Market Association, supporting Farmers Market, regularly consult with farmers, get yourself on the radar. This one here, raising awareness, supporting by local food campaigns, and uh, yeah, Comox, all on top of it. I think this one was from Vancouver. And so they say demonstrate support for economic development opportunities for agriculture, such as the farmer's market, locate farmer's markets near housing and transit services. So when you're thinking of where to extend a farmer's market, so if you're looking at adding a location, Go back to the policies and take a look. Where does our community want one? And that is immediately going to help you get better buy in with council if you're asking for a new location. Say, well, you say that you need to have one here. The nine most regional growth strategy outlined. I really like these the five A's of food security. This is where you're trying to make it easier for the folks who aren't involved in local food, who don't know what foodies are doing that you need food to be available, accessible, adequate, acceptable, and just down for them. Yeah, allowing 
allowing farmers markets and other outlets to sell local produce in all parts of the community. So then, agricultural area plans. There's a lot of minutes in this book, so we know a lot of these things. Agricultural area plans. Um, these are obviously all about agriculture, planning for agriculture. They're led by, led by regional districts and municipalities. They are specifically going to include the farming community. They're fairly new. They've only been around since the mid-1990s. Uh, so far, there's 49 of them created through, through the province. And it's all about how they can help support local farms, what zoning bylaws need to be changed, what specific actions can be done to help support local agriculture. So, highlight a few of them. So this was Kamloops Agricultural Area Plan. A representative from the farmer's market outlined on there. Anybody from Kamloops in here? Any idea who it was? Was it you? Were you on that? It was actually a representative from BC. From the BCA? I think it was probably, how long was this? Hmm, I'd have to go back to the Okay. Yeah, uh, I know that this plan, it was problematic though because he actually resigned. <laughs> that. <laughs> and there's that. Yeah. And he's now a city councilor in town, so awesome. the future is bright. <laughs> and those things, those parking curves and those bumps along the way, they can be hard. Yeah. I've heard it is just for the bits of parking cars, and I am a Fantastic. Uh, don't forget that a lot of First Nations are also undertaking area agriculture plans, so yes. I keep them in mind when you're looking for your partners. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Another you. thing I did is they, a lot of these plans look for interaction with the community, I invited them to come set up at the market to get that interaction. Absolutely. We, our town has a farmer's market booth every week. It's a great way for them to interact. And to add on to the First Nations piece, I mean, I just opened up the, a new pop market location on Muskegon Circuit by Gray. I already have other people ask me, but keep an eye out, like, if you're here open, because <laughs> some of these locations will be too large but it will be perfect for new farmers, farmers, and patients. And there are definitely like a lot of First Nations specific, like extra added challenges in terms of food security. So definitely keep that in mind to new farmers, farmers, and patients. A good way to go, absolutely. Uh, so these ones, there's this uh, in Kamloops saying encourage farmers markets on public property. And this is where, provided they meet the definition of the BC AFM's guidelines. It's a really great way to strengthen our whole organization at a local level. Even if we go back and forth on what that definition is. <laughs> no, we don't. But we're all ultimately, I think, trying to get to the same good thing. Anyway, Metro Vancouver here talks about for the number and size of farmers markets to expand, restrictions on the location of new and permanent market signs and signage promoting the markets has to be reduced. Reduce the red tape. Well, access to water and power has to be improved. They're not going to know that unless if you tell them. <laughs> and there's still not money to be done for Seriously? Just keep on it. So sorry. Oh, I don't have the problem. Uh, Metro Vancouver. Uh, yes, yeah, Metro Vancouver has an agricultural area plan. Who knew? Uh, and then this is here, they're looking at, uh, these are their goals, increase the number of farmer's markets, um, improve you know, the annual gross sales receipts for the farmer's markets. This is an interesting little sidebar statistic in Vancouver's agri in Metro Band's agricultural area plan, saying, um, so it's talking about the local multiplier effect of dollars that are spent. And so that they found a study from Seattle saying shifting 20% of local food dollars into locally directed spending would inject nearly $1 billion into that region's economy each year. And so, food grown by local farmers for export generates only $1.70 local economic activity for every dollar in sales. However, if that farmer sells at the farmer's market, it's going to generate $2.80 locally. Take those numbers and statistics that are done elsewhere and show them to your community, show them to your municipality that it makes fiscal sense to promote and support farmers' markets. And again, introduce zoning and bylaw changes. 
This one was from my area, from the regional district of Central Kootenays, talking about or against zoning bylaws and allowing venues to source local food wherever possible. We've come up against plenty of roadblocks saying, well, we've got agreements in place with our suppliers that we can't support local food. Again, from this conference, I've got some really great tips from other presenters on how we can change that perception and how we can change how our how how those dollars are spent and where they are spent. So, summary: build good relationships with your local government officials and other partners. It's only going to help your market. Some of you are going to have a much harder road than others. Find your ally. One voice on council can go a long way to so getting that kind of support. And that farmers markets, we take off so many different things that communities need help with. We all know this, we get this, but maybe our local council doesn't get it. So you have to explain it to them. Start with the basics, but don't make them feel stupid, but just play it. Uh, and there's obviously, I hope I've showed you some really good tools on ways that you can get involved in your local government planning, and uh, and that we all ultimately, Canada, Canadians need to eat 100 million meals a day or whatever that number was. That there's a big opportunity for growth here, a big opportunity for change. And if any of you ever want to get into global politics, farmers markets are a great job. Platform because everybody seems to know you anyway, so it worked out really easily for me. So that's the end of it. More questions? Anything? Um, I just wanted to say, um, after being in farm market management for 23 years, uh, there are no original problems. Markets have been around for a long, 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 long time, and many markets have worked their way through issues to come to some uh, viable solutions. So don't think that you're in it on your own. Don't think this is the first time this problem's come up. Most likely there has been a market that has worked their way through that issue. So make sure you're tapping in. I just keep going back to BC Association of Farmers Markets. They're a fantastic organization. We're really, really fortunate to have them. They have lots of resources on their website. Uh, another thing you can do is just go around and look at their list of markets. Find a market that might be a similar size to yours. We're dealing with a similar municipal body. Find out from other market managers how they have solved the problems. And if you're looking for information, sort of those sort of the bigger picture food security information to begin to educate your consumers and your municipal bodies, uh, don't forget the BC Food Systems Network. Again, it's a really powerful group with some very good research at their hands. Uh, their website is very comprehensive as well. Uh, and then in the bigger picture, the North American Direct Farm Marketing Association is kind of the big gurus in the in the North America. So don't think you're alone, and don't think that this problem is unique. It probably is just a little tweak on a problem that somebody else has already uh, come up with some resolutions. And listserv, just to yeah, the yeah, listserv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's what I was just going to say, is there is a farmer's market manager listserv, and if you're not already hooked up to it as a manager, board members can also look up to the same one. But I think that we should talk to BCFM about having Having them help us to set up one for boards to do some interactive discussion. Thank you so much for sitting through a very stuffy room. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.